Hello, good morning, everyone. We are going to start the webcast of the second quarter 2021. First, our CEO, Jay Mark Cruz, is going to start the presentation, and then our CFO, Enrique Freire, following by a Q&A with the whole executive management. The webcast is being exclusively uh, on the internet, and then it's going to be made available on our IR website. Before starting, I would like to let you know that any statements made during the event are based on the assumptions of EGP management and rely on information already available to the company. Forward-looking statements are not a guarantee of performance. They involve risks and uncertainties. Now I'm going to turn the call to Mr. Marcos da Cruz to start the presentation. Thank you, Marília. Good morning, everyone that are here with us today. We are going to present, as was mentioned, the results of our quarter. And I'm going to start by saying that we had good results. The companies uh, always have to have a high level of efficiency, and we do. But uh, we believe in terms of our performance in the second quarter was clearly positive. And positive why? Well, first, because uh, of our financial results that are going to be on screen uh, uh, right now. Here we have the main highlights of the second quarter. And basically, we had uh, almost 800 million of our EBITDA, comparing to 586 million in the same period uh, last year. That is an, uh, an increase of uh, plus 36.3%. Uh, and a net income, as you can see on the screen, 344 million, up by 45% the results of last year. So I'm starting from the bottom, but these results are positive in an environment that is clearly challenging uh, with difficulties, but the company as a whole was able to manage difficulties and come uh, with very robust results. Now, talking a bit about our different businesses in distribution, uh, we believe this is uh, the segment that most contributed to our increases in EBITDA, and that because uh, uh, well, uh, 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 there was uh, a uh, setup of several different factors. First, an increase of demand in the second quarter last year, uh, we had the first quarter of the pandemic. So uh, we were very much affected by, you know, lockdowns and others. And uh, now we had a very substantial increase. Uh, we, uh, uh, our areas of operation are clearly uh, industrial area. The concession area of Espiritu Santo is an area of exports. And therefore, as uh, the economy picks up strongly, uh, it contributes to our distribution business. Uh, also, uh, tariff readjustments that we had between the second quarter 2020 and the second quarter 21 also contributed to our results. On our uh, end, we also were able to reduce losses that this year in the second quarter compared to the first quarter, we did uh, achieve substantial reduction and remember that uh, that is uh, connected also to the reinforcement of our capex. We had a substantial increase in capex of 51% in distribution and basically focusing on improvements, expansion, and consequently uh, the uh, fight against our losses. Gross margin, an increase of 30%. As I mentioned before, distribution is the market segment that most contributed to the good uh, results that we present to you today. 
Next comes transmission. And here I would like to highlight uh, three main points. Uh, the first is that uh, transmission together with distribution is uh, one of the segments that together basically account for our good results. Uh, 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 you, I would say that distribution and transmission are the main uh, causes for us to have such increased EBITDA. Also, in transmission, we are planning for our future. Uh, as we go to transmission auctions, and we did go to one in uh, June, uh, we had uh, a very uh, strong dispute in uh, lot Q, and uh, we are preparing our future. And also, we are delivering what we promised. Uh, so we started uh, our commercial operations in lot uh, Q and lot 21, and we completed the acquisition of uh, a lot in Maranhão. As for generation trading and clients, well, this is an area in which uh, we always uh, have to consider uh, the whole of the business. We have marginally positive variations compared to last year, particularly in some areas that really justify our uh, performance. And uh, I think the key weight uh, in this business is to anticipate uh, to the competition, to different moves, putting into practice uh, measures to mitigate our risk. One of the risks, the hydrological risks that we know that are very important for this business. Very well then, these are the highlights that I would like to mention. Now we are going to go to the next slide. This is a slide that shows our uh, capital expenditure. Last year, in the first six months of last year, and here I'm talking about the first half year of last year, our capex was uh, around uh, 750 million reals. This year, as you can see, we are getting to 1.2 billion. That was again a substantial uh, increase. It is very true that last year, in the first uh, half year, especially the second quarter, there was the delay of uh, some investments. But uh, uh, we are going to invest 2.1 billion reals this year. Of our average uh, organic capex, and here I'm talking about organic uh, capex is uh, uh, basically uh, that the only thing uh, that was not organic uh, is here uh, the acquisition of AS Nova that you can see in the footnote, but we are investing in five years an average of two billion a year. So the year of 2021 is, is slightly above our average. Well, that to say that this is the year that we are going to meet our level of investments above last year, specifically the first half of last year that was uh, particularly affected. Well, now I'm going to turn uh, to Henrique Freire uh, to talk about more financial results. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, we have basically good measures to mitigate risk and capex to ensure our future developments. And Hiki, that's up to you now. Good morning, everyone. Well, first, I would uh, like to go to slide number four. And here we have a breakdown of our beta uh, quarter on quarter, that is the second quarter 2020. 
2020 and the second quarter 2021, both in our corporate view, but also our adjusted numbers. Uh, well, you can see, uh, you know, our adjustments in margin, uh, not considering IFRS, transmission and VNR. That is the regulatory rules. So talking about uh, uh, distribution, we had uh, a, an increase uh, uh, that is considerable to 121 million. Uh, then again, we have the adjustment of the assets that will not depreciate until the end of the concession. And so we have an adjustment of about uh, 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 7 million, which shows market growth and also the tariff adjustment that we had last year, especially in Sao Paulo that already benefited uh, uh, October, especially with the adjustments of parcel B. In transmission, we have an evolution of 62, and here again the IFRS uh, with the partial conclusion of some lots, especially 21 and Q. And so here we already have in total operation five lots. I'm going to talk about that further on. Hydric generation. Oh, well, uh, last year we had an even uh, more challenging scenario. Here it's slightly better. The uh, hydric crisis, I think, uh, is a very important point. Uh, basically, but for what is to come, what is uh, awaiting for us in the second half of the year. It is a very challenging scenario, but that is more to come. Per se, and, uh, well, during this period, we had no dispatch, and this year we did have a, a, a dispatch. We had also uh, a, a readjustment in November. And here we are slightly lower because with the dispatch, the cost basis increases slightly. And also last year, we did have some adjustments uh, that benefited the PSA margin. And therefore, these were corrections that uh, 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 had to be done and we have this difference. Well, in trading, uh, we had a very good results. Uh, 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 although uh, not as steep that we had in last year, but it's still very good results and quite consistent. So in terms of adjusted the bit, we went to 523 million to 660. So a very positive evolution of 18%. If we go to the next slide. Well, here you see the evolution of our net income in the quarter. What we have to highlight here, apart from the bit adjustment, is uh, the less positive results in terms of financial results. And that has to do with IGPM that we talked about and uh, the use of uh, uh, the hydrix and also the, the hydric plants, I'm sorry, and also the increase of IPC that the CA that we are going to talk about later on. Uh, the equity equivalence, we had a positive uh, result. Uh, basically because of Celeste, which is our subsidiary, and it is improving results. It's still not at the level that we should, uh, um, that we would like, but it is improving its results consistently. If we can go please to the next slide. Well, here we talk a bit about the distribution. And just to explain a bit of our margin and some of uh, the main initiatives that we are having. Here we have a market growth in our two distribution companies of about 16%. Of course, this growth is more uh, steep in the residential and industrial segment, which it shows a recovery of our economy. 
uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, industrial and commercial areas. In residential, not as much. Uh, if the residential uh, sector would have grown as much as the other segments, we would uh, have a higher uh, margin. But uh, when we compare this quarter to last year, which was the second quarter of 20, a period of the very deep lockdown, uh, we still have growth in the residential sector, which is uh, good news and shows consistency. Uh, so the idea is to continue evolving in the market. Losses, you can see, we had a drop in our losses. So we continue with our plan to fight losses and improve our network. Uh, last year, again, we had uh, to suspend some of our services and now they are back uh, in full speed in this quarter. Of course, respecting, uh, you know, the pandemic, but already going back to full speed. And we see uh, uh, that we are 1.3% uh, above the regulatory targets, both uh, uh, in both distribution companies, but still very uh, good results. And uh, the uh, recovery of our revenues by Real Invested, I think that shows our investments in technologies. Uh, and you can see, you know, whenever we look at this number, we see that this number is uh, increasing steadily and showing a very positive evolution. Let's go to the next slide now. Well, this is a comparison that is always very important. That is how we compare to the regulatory beta. And this is year-to-date data uh, for the whole of the first half year, not only the quarter. So in the first uh, half uh, of 2021, we have the regulatory beta of 571, and our corporate beta is 760. Of course, 121 is because of ENR, but still we see growth of 571 to 639. That is, we show that we are more efficient than the regulatory EBITDA and market values very positive, less losses and uh, OPEX is still positive. We have a slightly a gap on uh, losses and the provision for bad debt. Um, we have very challenging uh, rules, even you know for a different uh, uh, economic reality. Uh, uh, you know that uh, you know the average, uh, the target always incorporates historical values. We know there are things that. Uh, uh, have a say in those areas, but we believe that we have room for development. We have developed in recent years and we still have uh, uh, room to develop. On the next slide. We talk about transmission. Well, uh, here we have altogether eight lots in our portfolio, five of which uh, are already in total or partial operation, like lots 24, 11, 7 in Maranhão, lot Q uh, already in partial operation, and 21 as well in partial operation. Uh, the highlights here is that we are going to have uh, in 22 a net uh, RAP of uh, 664. And if you think of costs 2021, the cycle uh, the, uh, 2021, we would get to this amount considering the lots that we have, considering lot one that we were awarded in the last uh, auction that uh, uh, adds to this number. Uh, and here we see uh, 
you know, all the numbers, including inflation rates, but until 2023, for our portfolio, we are going to have a net RP of 700 million rounds. So again, a positive evolution that shows our developments uh, so far. In the end of, uh, in the whole of our portfolio, we had 80% of our CapEx already executed. Again, with evolutions in lots 21, 18, already reflecting in our results, not only because we are accounting for these lots, but also because we are advancing in their construction and in uh, relation to the regulatory EBITDA. On the next slide, we bring you an overview of our management of hydric risks, which I believe is a critical point today and will certainly be so in the next quarter. Uh, here we are showing seasonalization, but we have very consistent results. Uh, and again, that's the expectation. Uh, our mitigators uh, worked. Uh, we are putting place very good contracts. So I believe that we delivered in the whole of the first half year a margin of six, almost 600 million, which is a very consistent, solid result. Now, for the next quarter, how are we protecting ourselves? Today, most of our hedge is focused on the third quarter, and we have a total of hedge of 22% for the whole of the year. Uh, when we compare to the second quarter, this uh, number goes up uh, 30%. So the allocation that we have for the third quarter is 30% above that of the second quarter. Again, very much concentrated on the third quarter because we believe that's going to be the quarter that is going to be most challenging in terms of results. Most of this energy was uh, acquired last year. We had, uh, you know, prices below 200 reals per megawatt hour. So we believe that we are quite comfortable to uh, face uh, uh, the remainder of the year, although we have more adverse conditions than we expected. If we were to uh, be asked uh, last year, two years ago, what this year would be like, that's not what we expected. Here we talk a bit about uh, leverage uh, and indebtedness. And just for you to have an overview, we are in the end of the construction period for our transmission companies. So we still have CapEx to be executed and we still, we don't have the benefit of a bit, at least uh, adjusted a bit. So if you take a look at the second quarter, we had a net debt a bit of ratio of 2.8. Our corporate covenants are two times, but that has to do with the effect that uh, I talked about. In terms of costs and average terms, we had a positive evolution this year. We're able to extend terms with uh, uh, longer maturities. We also completed the process of uh, some of our transmission uh, companies, and therefore our average costs have uh, an evolution that has to do with the index rates that um, we have, especially interest rates that went up. In terms of uh, that uh, amortization uh, flow or schedule, we see uh, our uh, uh, timeline. Remember that in August we are going to have new issuances uh, that are expected for the year, namely in distribution and uh, therefore we see no risks in terms of refunding and I think that we are in a situation that is uh, fully controlled. Just a, a note on the uh, lower bottom index our bros that remember that we have uh, uh, had more issuances based on IPCA, particularly in transmission, as you can see, uh, because you're talking about uh, long term infrastructure and uh, therefore we are adjusting our flows uh, in the transmission companies. 
uh, many of these flows are capitalized as uh, construction advances as set by the rules. But uh, you see that in our financial statements and this direct indexes uh, when you compare uh, against the debt, you see an increase, but that's why we have a higher weight on IPCA than in CDI as we have in distribution and the hydro uh, uh, plants. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a note about our integrated data on costs and provision on uh, bad uh, debt, comparing the first half of this year to the first half of last year. Well, first last year we had uh, 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 lower activity because of the lockdown and the pandemic, especially the second quarter of 2020. So when we compare costs quarter on quarter, you naturally will see an increase because of uh, uh, the lockdown. And of course, there is an inflation recovery. We have an IPCA this year above 8%, IGPM uh, clearly above 30%, and that obviously has an impact. Uh, more IPCA, but IGPM also drags some of our uh, uh, costs up. And uh, here, when we make the comparisons, we should even recover, you know, uh, costs that we had in years before the pandemic. If you take a look at distribution costs, for instance, uh, uh, in previous years, uh, you see a, a much smoother evolution. And also our portfolio uh, now is different from what we had in the past in terms of breakdown of sectors. But anyway, if you see numbers, if you take a look at the numbers of 2019 and 21, we are much more uh, online. So there is no concern. We are evolving our costs still below inflation in a very consistent manner. So we expect to continue uh, uh, as so. Uh, in terms of provision for bad debt, this is something that really draws our attention. Again, we have quarter on quarter since uh, the second quarter last year. And uh, uh, these numbers, again, sometimes uh, show one event that happens in one quarter and not in the other. Uh, so if you just uh, consider, you know, quarter on quarter, you say, oh, so the second quarter we increased to 34 and the first quarter we had 30. But if you see, you know, the whole of the year, you can see that our costs are very much controlled. Our provision for bad debt really under our expectations. This is one of the most critical variables together with uh, the control of losses. So I would say that this is not a concern, quite the opposite. It is a show that we have control over these variables. And then the OPEX gross margin ratio. Again, we sometimes have the differences in the portfolio, but we have been advancing in a very positive way in uh, recent years. Now I'm going to turn the call back to Marcos da Cruz to complete the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Henrique. Uh, uh, after uh, Henrique's presentation, it's very clear our focus and our results for this uh, quarter. Now, with regard to ESG, uh, uh, well, you know, ESG is not just a report that we have to fill out. This is something that we truly value. Uh, this year, we, uh, in our report, are including, you know, uh, the environmental issue, uh, but also social and governance. And the idea is uh, in environment to expand our environmental and safety certification in 
our substations of uh, EGP Espirito Santos, uh, at the advances in solar energy, we have an objective of getting to one giga in 2025. And uh, this is our contribution for uh, the environmental area. In the social realm, you know, uh, lots of uh, initiatives. We invested uh, in social uh, uh, processes that were related to the pandemic. Also, uh, a few years ago, we uh, just uh, opened uh, the Museum of Portuguese Language uh, with uh, the presence of several heads of state and uh, we are the main sponsor of uh, this museum, you know, and the reopening that took place uh, just uh, recently. We also uh, are working together with the BNDS and other private companies in a program that is called Redeeming History and basically focuses on the conservation and revitalization of the Brazilian historical equity. And uh, undoubtedly, we are supporting the inclusion diversity program uh, with several commitments established in the social area. In terms of governance, we are very uh, proud to say that we have one third of women in our board of directors. This is uh, something very important. It shows a better balance to have more women and more diversity in our corporate uh, staff. And uh, I always think it is very important to make a point and showing in our uh, financial release our ESG commitments. And this is the final page that talks about our risks. Uh, generally, a company, when we talk to the market, we talk about our accomplishments. And it's important to talk about our accomplishments because they are good, but we have to talk about risks. Brazil and the whole of the world, uh, Brazil, because it has some specific factors, is uh, going through a very important hydrological risk, which in Brazil is particularly uh, important. Uh, we have uh, a pressure in terms of cash for distribution companies and other risks. And what I wanted to say is that, that it's not that we do not know the risks or that we hide the risks. We manage risks. It, I think that good management is not hiding risks, is managing risks, is to be aware of risks. Of course, there are counterpart risks in the financial area, but we implemented concrete measures to manage those risks. When you go, for instance, to transmission, of course, we can have differences in terms of time and budget, but with our contractors, we have very specific agreements, therefore mitigating risks. The same uh, goes for adjustments that we had last year in terms of prices, and that will happen this year. This will pressure losses and delinquency, in addition to pressuring cash. But again, we have concrete measure to each one of these situations, and our numbers will show the control. That to say that risks exist, but we are controlling them. And here we have the very last page, which talks about how 2021 matches our four pillars that are part of our strategy. 
First in growth, we have our growth very much focused on our core segments, which basically are networks, distribution and transmission. Distribution, we are talking about organic growth, transmission a bit more inorganic because we do have a need to buy uh, construction rights. Financial discipline, I think that the market has proof that we deliver financial discipline. We deal with amounts that the market understands. I never uh, make comments about data of the competition, but we do talk about our data. We want to grow, but not at any cost. Financial discipline is very important for us uh, to control our results and continue to grow. Efficiency uh, by means of uh, the recycling of our capital and the maintenance of our costs uh, controlled. And finally, we always have to put together innovation and sustainability. I think that the energy transition is uh, something that is very important and really fits to end the stage. We want to be leaders in the energy transition in the country. Well, now I'm going to turn back to Marilia so that we can start our Q&A. Thanks, Mark da Cruz, Henrique. Now we are going to start our Q&A. The first question comes from Carolina Carneiro from Credit Suisse. Two questions. First, about manageable costs in distribution. Uh, you had some increase in other expenses and provisions. Could you give us some color? Are there non-recurring expenses? Are they going to go up? And the second is the participation of EDP in the action of CTE3. Do you have other assets that interest you in the segment, even with the high competition? Okay, let's start with the first. First things first, when we compare the second quarter 21 and second quarter 20, we, there is a factor that cannot be forgotten, COVID-19. The second quarter 20 was basically the beginning of COVID in Brazil. And we know that uh, many things were, were postponed. Action, construction, CAPEX. Uh, I mentioned the uh, CAPEX amount and also costs. So when you make a comparison quarter on quarter, uh, you are comparing a more normal quarter, which is the second quarter this year, to a, a less normal quarter, which was the second quarter last year. And therefore, the impression that you have is that there is an increase in costs. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, uh, Jean Brito uh, Martins, which is the VP of distribution, but you're going to see that costs are in place. I think that is my overall answer. The costs are in place vis-a-vis -vis the moment that we are going now. João Brito. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, João. That's the answer. Costs are controlled. The thing is that when you compare uh, quarter on quarter, it's complicated. When you compare quarter on quarter with uh, the first half 19 and the first half uh, 21. In 19, we had 404 million in OPEX. In, in 21, we had 400 million, so 4 million below. So that shows that our costs that are more than controlled under inflation rates, which has to do with the work that we developed in terms of efficiency, dispatches, increase of productivity, optimization of teams, investments in digitization, digitalization. So our costs are controlled. 
the thing is, as uh, as well mentioned uh, last year, the second quarter was just the beginning of the pandemic, and we're postponing the investment of capex, opex, just to understand what the pandemic was going to bring to the business. Therefore, if you compare quarter on quarter you see an increase, but that uh, is just fruit of the circumstances of the beginning of the pandemic. When you compare 19 to 21, uh, the first half of uh, each year, you do see a nominal reduction of costs, which shows that the efficiency agenda is very strong and costs are controlled. Very good, so well, thank you very much. The auction in transmission. You're talking about CT E3. Well, the amount that we bid it is public. And we were far from the winner of the bid. We were 700 million reals, uh, more than 30%. Uh, below the winning bid. We would have liked to add the company to our portfolio. We thought that the company had potential. This is a company that needs a huge turnaround, but we are capable and have the know-how to do so. And uh, 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 it also counted on some form of green field, C3E3. Uh, it is, you know, like uh, winning an average uh, auction, uh, you know, for the coming years. So it was a company that interested us and we uh, placed a bid. But of course, the company has problems. So we were cautious and followed our financial discipline. Unfortunately, we were not awarded. Others won. That is, that's it. Uh, I'm going to turn to Luis Otavio, that is our transmission VP, not only uh, to talk about CTE3, but also to talk about transmission and the opportunities and how we face the transmission business. Luis, hello everyone. The opportunity of CTE3 was very well described by João, uh, but the company uh, had a deep analysis on the topic. We thought there was an opportunity for growth and we continued to look into other opportunities in the so-called secondary market. Remember, in the last uh, uh, in the last auction, we did win a bit, and we believe that the market still has opportunity for further consolidation. For example, you have the case of Goyas that will probably uh, happen still this year, and so you know it's a matter of uh, you know compensation and risks related to that. In transmission, we are prepared with substation technologies 230 and 500 kV. Uh, so to conclude, we are still paying attention to the auction market and the secondary market. Thanks, Luis. Marilia, any more questions? Our next question comes from Caio from Spata and also a follow-on of Carolina Carneiro on the same topic. I would like to know the levels of prices that you have hedges for the second half of 21 and the hydrological scenario for 22. Okay, let's start with what is simpler. We hope it rains in 22, but uh, we don't know if anyone on planet Earth uh, really knows that for sure. There are several news on El Nino, El Nina, but uh, we really don't know. I think no one in EDP uh, can tell whether we are going to have uh, 
uh, rains in the short period. If we go uh, and look in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, Brazil considered uh, this years as uh, uh, more dry than uh, wet. Uh, uh, and this is a year that is dry. But more important that, you know, dry years are becoming more common. And that has a huge impact on the electric sector, especially in Brazil, where the hydrological uh, energy is uh, very important. Well, now I'm going to turn again to our generation to talk uh, about this answer. Luiz Otávio, with you again. Well, to talk about, uh, you know, public data, we can got, get to 10% in November. Obviously, we'll have uh, to recover our reservoir. And uh, therefore, our need for hedge is also going to be true for next year. What does it mean? You know that we always have hedges beforehand. We have a position for 2022 in 20%. Remember that Enrique mentioned in the presentation. For the second half, we have more than 30% hedge with a very reasonable price. Is that about 200 reais? So, we believe in 2022, we are going to have more thermal uh, plants to dispatch. Therefore, we are going to have an influence on GSF and we are going to have higher prices. But, But the idea is to uh, continue the plans that we did this year with a hedge of already 20%. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vitor about the company indebtedness and the prospects to increase or stabilize it. Also, there is another question on the topic talking about the company prospects considering the increase in interest rates. Well, Enrique is going to answer the question. Now we are at 2.8 and at that uh, a bit of ratio, which is completely under our assumptions and plan. There is a uh, role in the company. Well, in Luis's answer, he talked about provisions. And likewise, uh, the companies do not have their own provisions. We understand and we analyze the provisions of each one of our companies. But now I'm going to turn to Enrique, to CFO, to answer this question with more color. Yes, uh, uh, just about the increase of that, uh, we reach uh, 2.8, but that corresponds to a peak and now we are going to have the incoming flows of transmission they are still not full but they will be and therefore when you see the transmission a bit you have you know the capex you have the beta but you don't have the income on flow 
But as Joel mentioned, I think that uh, we are uh, very well balanced. This is part of also what we have in our dividend policies. And I think that uh, we are very much controlled, you know, in terms of uh, that and the payout of dividends. In terms of interest rates, uh, they will go up. That is the expectation of the market. Today, we see a unique uh, situation in the Brazilian market. The CDI rate is in practice below inflation. So many uh, debts with negative rates, which is a bit absurd in the Brazilian reality. And so it's natural that the situation is going to be corrected uh, by uh, the end of the year. We believe that uh, uh, the interest rates will go up. And IPCA, uh, and IPCA plus, that has an influence on the debts uh, that uh, are issued. But I would say that we also have a business with a natural hedge and very effective to an increase with distribution rates. Uh, we have, you know, we move par apart with inflation and in transmission companies. We have the RAP revenues also following inflation, in this case, IPCA. So in a way, this is a natural hedge for any increases, you can see a mismatch, you know, along the year, the, the fee goes up in one month and not in the other. But uh, if you see the year in as uh, a, a whole in full, uh, we are uh, fully hedged to balance our revenues and costs. I think, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you, Enrique. Marilia, any more questions? Our next question comes uh, uh, from Maru about the tax reform. The company has developed excellent work and good management in uh, recent years. When you talk about uh, taxation on dividends that is being discussed in Congress, I would like to know if you are looking into what can happen even before the uh, reform is passed. Well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, remarks. We work very hard uh, every day. The 3,200 people that work in EDP Brazil and our objective is to create value to our shareholders and to society. Well, in terms of taxation, of course, we are uh, following from close because that is part of our obligation, the uh, tax reform. We know that it's still not stable. We are looking into the several opinions. Of course, as it becomes more concrete, we are going to uh, take uh, uh, measures uh, to protect ourselves, but I would like to highlight that this reform is uh, evolving to the OECD levels, which is normal. Remember that uh, OECD countries uh, in Latin America, North America, and Europe, there are other realities that in Brazil we still do not uh, have. So if you think uh, of consolidation of taxation, consolidation of taxable profits, so you have to see the reform within a global balance. And in our opinion, we are still far from this global balance. And I can ensure you this is a topic that we are following from close because it is a point of concern. But in the end of the day, we believe that uh, things are moving towards balance. It is a concern, of course, but we don't think it is something that is going to jeopardize our uh, company. Enrique, would you like to add to that? Uh, sure. 
well, basically choose what you said. It's too early for us to make comments because we don't know exactly what it's going to be like. There are some points that concern us a bit, especially a waterfall taxation uh, and uh, taxing uh, less uh, uh, profit and more the payout of dividends. That is an OECD standard. So I think this is walking into a conversion. The problem is when you go into, you know, uh, holdings, you know, uh, uh, and you have, you know, consolidation of companies. Um, uh, 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 I believe that uh, uh, this is still going to be stabilized. Of course, we can have even impacts on our corporate structure, on our uh, 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 companies in Brazil, they could be penalized in the way they are organized. So the way to mitigate that would be to merge some companies and uh, uh, decrease levels between holdings and subsidiaries. So that would be a possible move. But we are monitoring that. It is still too early to, you know, uh, 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 make any statements. We believe that in the end of the day, uh, uh, they are reaching consensus and we hope holdings are not so penalized. I would say that this is the major concern. I think taxation of dividends is also a bit excessive. Of course, when the government is establishing a rationale to uh, set behaviors. Uh, but we know that there is still lots of negotiations to go on. So in the end of the day, uh, uh, we have to be cautious that, uh, and wait for the final results. But of course, we are following and we can have impacts even in the way that we organize or how we manage our business, not only us, but all the companies in Brazil. Thank you very much, Henrique. Marília? Our next question comes from Fernando Magalhães. Good morning. Congratulations on your result. I'd like to ask if the company has a target for the composition of its uh, uh, energy sources for the future, that is wind, solar, and uh, hydro. And what are your plans in solar? Well, the company uh, now is investing in solar energy. We have, uh, as you know, hydro plants. We do not invest uh, in wind energy uh, at the moment. We have a very clear and ambitious goal of one giga in solar by 2025. The target is a combination uh, of uh, uh, several sources uh, to address the market in solar energy as a whole. Uh, we are looking into uh, 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 the area and it is an area that interests us. Carlos, our VP is going to complete the uh, answer. Well, as Mark is said, in the next five years, we are going to focus our investments in solar energy. As well, Mark has mentioned, we want to get to one giga of salt capacity by 2025. Uh, and this one giga is going to be distributed generation and uh, utility scale. We are developing projects uh, for utility scale uh, we have two projects uh, on the uh, way that will start generating energy as of uh, 24. This is a joint effort with our sister company, EDP Renewables, and the other half of one giga is in distributed energy. Uh, the idea is uh, 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 to advance the air. We already have more than 50 and the idea is to get to 100 megawatts, which is 
uh, about 1% of uh, the total installed capacity of solar in Brazil, in called uh, B2B, B2C, and etc. By 2025, our project uh, projection with one giga is to have a 5% share. So, you know, it's almost a tenfold increase in terms of installed capacity for solar energy and uh, a five-fold uh, increase in our market share. So it is very ambitious and we are going to focus on P2P, uh, large scale, or also seeking a niche for uh, the small and medium businesses in distributed uh, generation. That is our ambition. Thank you very much, Carlos. Very clear. Marilia? Our next question, what are the actions that EDP have taken in social investment due to the pandemic? Well, uh, uh, this is a very important topic, social responsibility, uh, not only in the pandemic, but uh, always. So I'm going to turn to Fernanda Pires, our VP of ESG, to answer the question. Thank you, João. Well, we know that the pandemic is not over. And as João mentioned, we have a very consistent agenda. Looking into the social area, we continue with uh, responsibility investments and uh, uh, investing in our agenda. It's always been part of EDP, but last year we had a specific initiative to fight hunger and also to help the national health system. And we continue with the agenda for 2021. More than 5 million paid out in the states of Sao Paulo, Espírito Santo, Ceará, and Tocantins. We are working with the authorities, and in addition to actions to fight hunger and health, we also put together a committee for social innovation to talk about projects to generate income and other initiatives that fit more our mid- and long-term agenda. Thanks, Fernanda. Well, I'm going to now turn the call to Marília, and it was a pleasure to be with you today. Once again, Marília and the whole IR team are here for you for any questions or specific clarifications that you need about uh, the EDP group in Brazil. Marília? Well, thank you very much. We are now closing our Q&A session. All the other questions that were not answered on the webinar are going to be answered by the RR team. We thank you very much for joining and see you next quarter.